the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Commanding Self by Idris Shah. Section 1. Outworn Techniques Question. Is there any value in studying the teachings and activities of Sufi and other systems of the past? Some of them have died out, and some seem to belong to a past era not applicable today. Answer. There is value in studying those which do have contemporary application. That means, of course, that the only people who can indicate which body of material, or what part of a body of material, to study are those who understand what they meant, for whom they were intended, and what their effect was designed to be. This, in turn, means that mere imitation is useless. Sufi study is prescription, not imitation or even tradition. There is, incidentally, no such thing as something dying out in the Sufi sense. A medical prescription, for instance, does not die out. It is superseded. Broadly speaking, anything which is recorded, for instance on paper, belongs to a past era. Unlike the case of a doctor's prescription, it is not likely that the condition for which Sufi exercises, say, were prescribed in the past, will recur today. We are not dealing with the human body's ills. So we are back at the question of the teacher and his expertise. This is so important that you can actually discern a false or deluded teacher by noting that anyone who merely causes others to repeat Sufi exercises prescribed for dozens, hundreds, even thousands of years ago is not a Sufi teacher at all. He may be a traditionalist, a religionist, a ceremonialist, but he cannot help to develop the Sufi perception in others or in himself. Tradition, colour, movement and so on have an undeniable appeal. They even have a therapeutic effect at times, but they are not Sufic activity. They are the degeneration of its externals, just as surely as the refilling of a medicine bottle with water and admiring its label is devoid of value except for the placebo, the psychological effect. And that can be obtained in almost any way. Besides, there is no such thing as a spiritual placebo. Recruitment and Education Question. Have you ever written on the subject of the importance of Sufi knowledge for the present day? Answer. Until recently, very little. The reason is that if you become identified with a stance, people will criticise it and write you off, and what you are trying to do will suffer unless you condition people to support you, ending up with a kind of social group that improves tribalism but stultifies knowledge. Hence, I have instead worked very hard to get facts known and understood, first of all. This has really paid great dividends. The general stock of information has thereby increased, and information which was not accessible has been redistributed, bypassing personal prejudice. I want people to have information before they decide to invoke their desires to support or to oppose an individual, a tradition or a system. This is, of course, making the distinction between a recruitment activity and an educational one. Understanding oneself People are anxious to understand themselves. Part of Sufi preparatory activity is to make this possible, for the illustrable obtuseness of most of us is almost universal. Certain approaches are worth noting from this point of view, for in this field it is quite possible, though not inevitable, 
that people may learn from the behaviour of others. The first concern of all is to realise that we must study the wants and needs of people approaching the Sufis. Wants are not necessarily needs, even though wants may be the fuel and stabilizers of the present condition of the approacher. I have here a bundle of correspondence from someone who wanted to work with us in making a film on the life of Al-Ghazali. He has experience of filmmaking and suggests that helping us in this way will be a contribution towards our work and also help him to learn by working with special materials. We answer informing him that, however theoretically desirable the project, we are already working on a plan of this kind. Moreover, and more importantly, we cannot work with externalist perceptions of things like this. In other words, Sufi films have to be instrumental, planned for a certain effect. Only Sufis can do this, and in doing so would not necessarily choose this filmmaker. His interest in the subject is not in itself a qualification. Here is a selection of correspondence with a scholar who is very friendly and wants our help, and to help us, in finding out more for publication about a certain dervish order. We answer to the effect that Sufis work with calculated methods. This is not the time or the place, and these are not the people to undertake this specific activity. A third collection of transactions concerns a lady who has written a book about our work and seeks permission to quote from materials which we have published which she is using to make certain points, so that we may become better known and understood. We reply that there are two kinds of materials on Sufism, those written from an outside viewpoint and those written to further the Sufi activity. The latter may not appear to be Sufi books at all, but they can be produced only by people with a certain kind of insight. The descriptive or propagandist book is not a Sufi one, therefore we are not able to support them. Indeed, we are ignorant of what they might be like. We add that to include materials of ours might not only be of no use to our work, it might cause readers to imagine that the book represents something which we authorise. Here, finally, is correspondence from a man of religion who assumes that all spirituality is the same, and seeks to have us ameliorate our harsh attitudes towards various beliefs and activities in the religious sphere. Now, all these approaches have certain things in common, which, though perhaps visible to a completely outside observer, are unperceived by the writers. The first evident characteristic is that the person has assumed that he or she is doing something useful without knowing whether this is true or not. Secondly, it is also inherent in this assumption that we are working as randomly and on an equally shallow basis, that, in fact, we have no long-range insight. Thirdly, the assumption is here that the particular aspect, item, and so on is useful. Fourthly, that we are not already working on a plan, Fifthly, that there is no other plan in which this person might take part. Sixthly, that one can start in the middle. That is to say, that this individual can adopt an idea and that it is sure to be good without any of the absolutely essential learning which alone can qualify someone for meshing into such programs. In short, the question which should have been asked is, can I learn? What, if anything, can I do? All Sufis teach this first. It is hard to do so because this bold statement, you need to do something else first, is very often taken by the commanding self as a rejection or as a challenge, instead of it being taken for what it really is, a constructive and well-meant description of the other person's current position and needs. This is what lies behind the concepts of taubat, repentance, turning back from ignorant assumption in these cases, and khidmat, 
service, which means to serve oneself best by not trying irrelevant things, just as much as being in the service of truth. Criticism and Learning Question. Sufi teachers in their books and in the stories about their teaching interactions often complain about the problems there are in dealing with people and criticize their followers and all kinds of other people constantly. If circumstances are as bad as that, is there any hope of teaching getting underway? Answer. In the first place, what some people regard as criticism is also to be seen as being descriptive of a situation. Secondly, the description of people and their behaviour is itself an integral part of the teaching process. When you see, hear or read of such interchanges, you are in fact seeing the teaching underway, so there is no question of when will it start. Part of the effect of the teaching is to observe this, so that if you have not noted it, it is you who are not learning, not that the teaching is not operating. Question. Then presumably if one has not observed these things, one cannot be taught. Answer. Not at all. Not to have observed something in one way or on one occasion, or in one of many ways or on many occasions, is no indication that the person cannot be taught. Persistence in teaching is paralleled by persistence in learning. People are, in fact, induced by various approaches to expose different facets of themselves to the teaching so that they can eventually learn. Indeed, reverting to the first question, it is often the very forcing of an inhibition upon certain approaches that induces the learner to stop playing what are, in fact, games and may induce him to focus seriously on what is being taught. But if, because of his arguing and wrangling, this process cannot be carried out, he cannot learn. This is why dialecticians cannot teach anything in the Sufi way, and why intellectualist or emotional approaches from the students cannot yield results beyond mutually stimulative reactions, which are absent in the Sufi teaching situation and are avoided or suppressed by the kind of criticism to which you refer. Why should I change now? There was once a merchant who bought a pair of shoes. He wore them until they were almost worn out, and then, because they were comfortable, he had them patched and wore them until even the patches were in ribbons. Patches were then put on patches, and although misers and people who did not think much about things applauded his economy, the shoes were unwieldy and unpleasant to look at, and they scuffed up a lot of dust in the street. When people complained about the dust, he always answered, If the dust were not there, the shoes would not raise it. Go to the municipality and complain about the streets. The shoes made a lot of noise as the merchant clumped down the street, but most people had become used to this, and the others were in a minority and eventually had to get used to it. So, with enough people applauding his carefulness with his money, and plenty of people prepared to get used to his nuisance value, what the rest thought was of no account. It became understood that the merchant's shoes should be as they were, by the merchant and by everyone else. So accepted was it that something quite unusual would have to happen for people to start to think about the matter afresh. And, sure enough, one day it started to happen. The merchant had bought some rare glasses for a low price and expected to resell them and make a huge profit. In celebration, he decided to go to the Turkish baths and have a luxurious steaming and soaking. While he was in the bath, he started to wonder whether he should not buy a new pair of shoes out of his expected profits on the sale of the glasses. But then he put the idea out of his mind, saying to himself, They will do for a time yet. 
but somehow the idea stayed in his mind, and somehow it seemed to have affected his thinking, the shoes and even the glasses and much else as we shall see. The first thing that happened was that, as he left the bathhouse, he automatically put his feet into a pair of very expensive slippers and walked away with them. He had left by the wrong door, and the slippers which were there, in a corresponding position to his own terrible footgear, belonged to the chief judge of the town. When the judge came out of the baths, he missed his slippers and could only see the awful shoes of the merchant, which he was forced to wear back to his house. Of course, like everyone else in the city, he recognised the monstrosities. In less time almost than it takes to tell, the judge had the merchant brought to his court and fined heavily for theft. Bursting with indignation, the merchant went to the window of his house, overlooking the water, and threw his shoes into the river. Now he thought he would be rid of these instruments of loss, and he would be able to escape their influence. But the power of the shoes was not yet exhausted. A fisherman pulled the shoes up in his net soon afterwards. They tore his nets, so heavy were the nails with which they had been studded in the course of their many repairs. Furious at the merchant, for, like everyone else, he could see whose shoes they were, the fisherman took them back to the merchant's house and hurled them through a window. They landed on the precious glass which the man had bought and smashed it to tiny pieces. When the merchant saw what had happened, he almost exploded with rage. Going into the garden, he dug a hole to bury them. But the neighbours, seeing him so unaccustomedly at work, reported to the governor that the merchant seemed to be seeking treasure, which, after all, belonged by law to the state. Now the governor, convinced that there would be rich pickings here, spent on credit and got into debt for some very fine porcelain which he had always coveted. Then he called the merchant and told him to hand over the buried gold. The merchant explained that he was only trying to get rid of his accursed shoes, and after the governor had had the garden completely dug over, he fined the merchant a sum which covered his trouble, his porcelain, and the cost of digging, plus something for causing the officials to waste their time. The merchant now took his shoes far away from the city and threw them into a canal. Presently, carried by the water into the irrigation channels, they blocked a pipe and deprived the king's garden of water. All the flowers died. The merchant was summoned as soon as the gardeners had found and identified the shoes, and he was again fined a large sum. The merchant, in desperation, hacked the shoes in half and buried one piece in each of the four main rubbish dumps which surrounded the city. Thus it was that four dogs, scavenging in the dumps, each found half a shoe, and each one carried it back to the merchant's house, barking and growling for rewards, until the people were unable to sleep or to walk in the streets for their aggressiveness and fawning. When the dogs had been placated, the merchant went to the court. Honoured judge, he said, I wish formally to relinquish these shoes, but they will not give me up. Please, therefore, execute a paper, a legal document, which attests that anything done by, with, or through these shoes shall henceforth have no connection with me. The judge thought the matter over. Eventually he pronounced, since I am unable to find in my books any precedent for the assumption that shoes are persons, in any sense of the word, capable of being allowed to do anything or prohibited from doing anything, I cannot accede to your request. Strangely enough, as soon as the merchant bought a new pair of shoes, he had been going barefoot, nothing untoward happened to him again. This, of course, is the answer to the question, why should I change my ideas, my ways, or my thoughts now? Such questions can only be answered by allegories, 
claiming that things are happening as a consequence of doing nothing. And these things, unfortunately, are not as obvious in their connection with our ways as the shoes were in the case of the merchant. After all, if things were so obvious, nobody would need to ask the question, would they? Science and Philosophy Question. What do the Sufis think of the controversies between science and philosophy and between similar groups of people with varying formulae for the reorganization of the world? There are so many systems, though no doubt we can adjudicate between them since we are, so to speak, their employers. Answer. Perhaps you have not heard of the story of the two masseurs at the bathhouse, their employer and their customer. The ancient author Hamadani, in his Makama of Halwan, explains this point very subtly, showing just how deep and how superficial and irrelevant such systems can be in the absence of knowledge. The Bathhouse There was once a man who, returning from a pilgrimage, entered a town and had careful inquiries made as to the very best bathhouse where he could refresh himself and obtain good attendance with warm water and pleasant perfumes. He eventually found himself at the most highly recommended of such establishments. As soon as he entered its door, an attendant massaged his forehead with clay, as is the custom, and then went out. Soon afterwards, another masseur entered and kneaded and pummeled the client. Now the first man returned and immediately attacked his fellow. Leave that head alone, it is mine, he shouted. The second man denied the claim. They fought, rolling on the ground. The first was crying, This is my head, for it was I who massaged it with clay. Not so, said the other claimant. It was rather I who rubbed the body upon which the head sits. When the two were exhausted, the owner of the place was called to adjudicate. He, in his turn, asked the customer to give an opinion as to which of the men owned the head. The traveller cried out, For goodness sake, it belongs to neither of them, it is mine. But the owner of the bathhouse was infuriated by this. Turning to his employees, he said, May God curse this damnable individual, for his head is obviously useless. I do not see why you are bothering with him. Let him go to hell. Human Development Question. How long does the process of human individual development actually take? Answer as long as it takes the teacher, the individuals and the group to be in the right harmony. In your terms, this might be ten minutes or ten years, or more or less. Question. It is said that only one in a hundred thousand can make the grade. Answer. Is it? Question. Is this correct? Answer. It is not correct for us and those in our situation. I am not responsible for what others have said at other times, in other places and situations. If you want to lump together what various people have said to you or to other people and use the result, you are an anthologist or synthesist, not a seeker in the sense in which we use the term. Question. But I have never heard of such an idea. Surely the teachings of the great ones who have come before us are still valid. Answer. They are still as valid as they ever were, given the same conditions and students. How they are to be understood and made use of depends entirely upon the right experience and ability of those who are trying to make use of them. The melancholy fact is that the conditions and seekers have changed. Their curriculum is correspondingly inappropriate. The quality of one's search. Question. Is it not better to have spent some time, even years, in trying to find some sort of truth 
than not to have tried at all. Surely we cannot say that one has not gained something through having spent time with books or people connected with an esoteric or higher search. Answer. If it has been a wrong search, there is probably no advantage, and certainly a great deal of disadvantage. This is a question which is asked again and again by people who want reassurance. If they are prepared to face it, here is the rest of the answer. They have spent years with books or people, therefore something must have been attained. The reasoning, from the point of experience from which we speak, is false. A donkey eats a melon, it remains a donkey. You will never reach Mecca because you are on the road to Samarkand are two sayings which are intended to illustrate the position of some of these people. What exactly have they gained, apart from a sense that they must have gained something? The answers to this question, from the people themselves, generally consist of assertions that they feel better, that they feel happier, or that they have been able to help others. There are a lot of other answers too. The situation really is that unless they know what they have gained, how much of it and where they are going, the gain, if any, is at best latent. It cannot be regarded as useful at the time. It has no worth at all until activated by harmonization with a significant activity in the real tradition. I meet many people who have worked hard in this field, have tried so hard that they did not know when they had reached the end of their constructive development. They needed certain other developments and consequently have deteriorated through repetitious activity until they are, in fact, no use at all, though they may feel that they are and may contrive to transmit this sensation to others. The worst are those with vague, sporadic, incomplete connections with an invisible world. In fact, such feelings are mere distortions or the stirring of a potentiality which their own subjectivity endows with fantastic, distorted entities and meanings and often attempts to systematize. And the worst of these seek similar equally distorted individuals or examples of literature and prove their experience by reference to these. They suffer from concealed arrogance. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation and is copyright 2019. All rights reserved.